Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. So if I'm a 30-year-old Virginian watching this, I would, wow, I should, I should become AI literate. I should improve my employability and future career by gathering skills. But it's not just about getting skills. It's about getting skills that, that come with a credential, whereas if I move to Virginia, to Vermont, or to Vegas, I'm bringing a skill, but I'm also bringing a credential that an employer will recognize, okay, yeah, you've, you've got the skill. Are there you know, industry standard recognized credentials in the AI field that are portable like that, where I could gain the credential and move somewhere else in the United States and an employer, human resources professional would look at it and say, yeah, that, okay, we, we understand that. You, I see you shaking your head, no, Mr. Cotron. I, I think the, uh, thank you, Senator. The, um, it, there's often this reflexive reaction to say, well, yes, can we, can we create an AI credential? What are the AI jobs of the future? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you talk to folks, some people say, well, prompt engineer is the job of the future. And to me, that's as ludicrous as going back to 1998 and, and saying a Google search engineer is gonna be a job of the future. Right. We do not know what the jobs of the future are. If you're 30, the real question is, how are you gonna build the soft skills, the critical thinking, the ability to work in teams collaboratively? You, you called those durable skills in your, in your opening testimony. I like that better than soft skills. I, I think that's right. Um, and I think that's actually a really big area that we need to focus on, is how do we actually codify what these skills would look like, especially in a world where the, the workforce is going to change faster than these credentials and frankly our education system is going to be able to change. And this is a really big blind spot that we have. This is like a huge tanker ship we're trying to now navigate down you know, river rapids. Um, and the best answer that I can come up with is the teachers, the professors, the schools, the, the folks who are really thinking about training our, our teams, they are on the front lines. And to me, it's, it's really scary the fact that a company can depreciate an investment in an AI tool and get a tax, a favorable tax treatment for that. They can't depreciate an investment in employee Training. upskilling. Yeah, yeah. Doc, Dr. Kimber, you used the phrase, we, we should ex expand skills-based training in your testimony. So obviously, you know, we are moving from a world where it's about degrees to degrees are great, but also skills, credentials, as long as they're valid, are great. What, what did you mean when you said things we can do is to expand skills-based training? Thank you, Senator Kane. When I was talking about skills-based hiring in particular, if I may mm -hmm. use that term, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was thinking a lot about the data that we see at LinkedIn, which um, if we think about what are required skills for a job and, and, and push away the idea of like, what credential do you have, even if it was a degree, a former title, prior experience, and just say, what skills are you able to perform? Um, what we find is that for any role, on average, you can increase the pool of eligible candidates sometimes by as much as 20 times. Yeah. So if, if I may, I would just say what I think can happen is ideally we would be promulgating more pathways for employers, for recruiters, for state and local and federal government uh, roles to be skills-based as opposed to, let's say, degree-based or prior experience because you pull in many more people. Right. And I would just add one last point, which is that what we found in our own data is when you expand that talent pool by thinking about what people either can do or potentially can do as a skill, you actually include more underrepresented people. So, for example, women are 26% more represented when you look at a skills-based pool than a non-skills-based pool. We, we have a lot of work to do here in Federal Policy Center. Braun and I are working on this. We think Pell Grant should not be just a, limited to college degrees. Why not high-quality career and technical education? Um, and, and yet, we've had a long bias against career and technical education. It should be high-quality, but why would we benefit college and not that? The military has tuition assistance programs for active duty. My son used to be a Marine officer. He could approve somebody in his platoon for up to 4,500 bucks a year for a college class. But if he had an ordnance specialist who was trained like in welding, and all they needed was 300 bucks to take the American Welding Society certification exam, which is a credential that's completely portable, he'd have to say, no, I can't give you 300 bucks because it's not college. Mr. Wilson, I'll finish with you if I can real quick. Community college, I think this is a key part of this. And I imagine a lot of the folks who in a, who gain these skills at a community college, they are there to gain the skill, not necessarily the associate degree. And sometimes the best way to gain the skill is in a short-term, high-intensity class that, does, that isn't a 15-week-long semester and hence is not eligible for Pell Grant. I, am I right about that? Um, I believe our program was available for a Pell Grant, uh, Pell Sorry, Grant Center. 
Now, what I will say is um, the workforce element at the community college level, I think, is what really we should really pay attention to. Um, it's a two-year format where you are actually working on what you're going to be doing once you graduate instead of taking that first two years to do general education classes. Mm -hmm. You're actually doing the hands-on work, and that's why the applied and the applied degree comes yep. into play because you've actually applied the skills to something, whether it's in your... Uh, your last class you know that you have to take or whether it's an internship you got to do over summer you've actually experienced that and you're more equipped to actually get into the workforce um, and I think if we pay attention to these degree programs there are a lot of community college around the country you know Houston Community College is a great example Miami Dade College Chandler Gilbert Community College these are community colleges that took the initiative to start AI workforce programs at mm -hmm. their school and now some of them have been able to turn it into a bachelor's at the community college level, which many people didn't know was possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is very beneficial. I've seen the students coming out of these programs. I'm one of them. A lot of them are very well equipped. A lot of them are very uh, sound in what they know and they're very hungry. They just need um, many companies maybe change their hiring practice or human resource departments to take off the master's or bachelor's degree requirement because they know they're already capable with their two-year degree that they got. As I hand it back to the chair, uh, we're looking at the same thing with federal hiring. Do you have to have a college degree to get a lot of federal jobs? And the answer is no. Do you have to have a college degree to be assigned by a, f a federal contractor to work on a contract with the federal government? If you have the skills to do the job, it shouldn't be restricted to those with college degrees when we are in a skills-based world these days. Thank you. I'll yield it back. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The we did a, back when I was governor in Colorado in 2017, I guess, 2016, 